Okay, so uh, unlike the previous talk, this is going to be a result pr presentation addressing this topic of programming for future computer architectures. So I'm just going to be talking about a project we've been working on at uh, UCSD for a number of years. And um, those of you who know me, know me, know that I am fundamentally a, an application code developer at heart. And I take 15 years of my life to conceive, implement, and then share community codes. And I started with the Zeus codes in the 80s. That was basically done by 2000. Started up the Enzo project in the mid-90s. That's basically out of my lab now. So I'm like, you know, uh, empty nester. Uh, Enzo's going great, by the way. So five years ago, I started the next thing. Uh, which is uh, what we call cello, Enzo P. And it all starts with an, uh, an impulse with me. I want to do that. And so here is my motivation slide. I call it uh, the N-body envy. So we've all seen these awesome N-body simulations that um, have just a tremendous amount of substructure in them. And uh, this happens to be PKD Grav 2, but, you know, there's a half a dozen codes that can make pictures like this. And over here is ENZO, which is a multi-physics AMR code. This is a simulation of um, a dwarf galaxy at redshift 7.35, and it's a radiation hydrodynamics code, you know, with, uh, you know, of course, dark matter and cooling and all that good stuff. The particles are actual star clusters. And this circle here, which is the virial radius of this dwarf, if you could follow this to redshift zero, it would make one of these things, you know, a dwarf galaxy satellite of the Milky Way. And we can't do that. And why can't we do that? Because we're not able to harness modern petascale computers. And the reason why we can't has nothing to do with uh, physics. It has to do with data structures and mapping data structures to complex hierarchical computers. And so the AMR data structure for ENZO was designed in 1994 by Greg Bryan for computers that had 100 processors. So why should that thing scale to 100,000 cores? shouldn't, and it doesn't. And so basically ENZO is uh, at the end of the line in terms of its useful lifetime as a, you know, high-end code. It's great for terascale applications, but we can't get there. Now why can this get there? It's because, in my view, it is using an intelligent data structure that can be mapped partitioned and mapped to a parallel computer. And then it has this very simple physics algorithm that works on the data structure. Um, but if you separate the physics from the data structure, you see a path forward, which is uh, build a smart, scalable data structure for Enzo's AMR, and then migrate the physics onto that. So that's, in a nutshell, what the project is all about. So um, this, this is uh, actually two pieces of software. Cello is the, an extreme scale AMR infrastructure. And when I say extreme scale, I, I expect it to take us to 10 million cores or beyond. That was the design point, exascale. Uh, and then Enzo P is, uh, and then, you know, an astrophysics application uh, built on top of Cello in the same way that Flash is built on top of Paramesh, Enzo P is being built on top of Cello. And we finally got this thing working. So here you see uh, a blast wave problem where the letters are high pressure gas and we're running the PPM hydrodynamic solver on this. Now, the underlying data structure is a forest of trees, quad trees, oct trees, 
the difference is every leaf node is a block of size, whatever you want, and it's uniform. So in this case, we're running PPM uh, at an effective resolution of 4096 squared, and we're running it on a laptop. So let me show the movie. It's really cool. And obviously, I'm very excited about this. So do you think we could lower the yeah, shades? Uh, Oh, on the butt. Okay. Drapes down. Okay. Okay. Okay, so this is uh, a little animation of this uh, PPM hydrodynamics simulation. And, you know, we can zoom in and we can watch shock physics happening. You can see uh, Rick, Rick Meyer Meshkoff instabilities happening as shock waves hit contact discontinuities. Every one of these little squares is a 16 squared patch. So this is a quad tree with seven levels of refinement uh, with 16 squared patches at the bottom. And as I said, this is working on a lap. So this is bas basically a um, existence proof of uh, this concept. And the exciting result we got just two weeks ago was we got this running on blue waters. Uh, and these, these are the scalability results. This is parallel efficiency. This is on one core. And you always see a big drop when you go from sequential to parallel, no matter how you do the parallel. There's a certain overhead. But you see once, for, so this is 8, 64, 5, 12, uh, 20, 48, 32,000 cores. And we have a 64K point. Um, and it's, it's scaling very well in terms of performance. But more importantly is the memory efficiency, which is the ratio of the total memory footprint of this uh, at, with P processors divided by the memory footprint per core at one process. And it's, it's basically unity. And the reason it's unity is we designed it that way. When you go to exascale, you, there cannot be any replicated data. It's got to be fully distributed data structure. And so this uh, quad tree is fully distributed, um, and you see the consequences. So we're very excited about this. Now, I guess we can turn the light back on. So that's only part of it. The other part of it is um, I've spent my whole career doing heroic optimizations for supercomputers. And at the end, it's all the same tricks. If you've been doing it as long as I have and Mike Warren has, history repeats itself. It's all the same tricks, and it can be done with enough time and effort. And when I review the Gordon Bell Prize papers, what I see are the finalists have assembled the teams that were able to make the heroic optimizations in time for the deadline. And hey, you can do that for the rest of your life if you want. But I'm done with that phase of my life. I want to write a portable high-performance code. And the only way you can do that is address this um, people problem, the scale, scaling problem in the people dimension. And the solution I'm taking is object-oriented programming, um, which is something that I don't actually speak, but my research programmer, James Bordner, is fluent in it. And this is really his achievement that I'm showing here. And so we um, have come up with a uh, object-oriented AMR 
system, if you will. Think of it like paramesh, where the components are all uh, objects, you know, with class hierarchies. Uh, and so, cello, which is this part in the middle, is uh, like a flash, uh, like, like a paramesh thing that handles everything about the simulation. Simulation consists of defining a problem, and then you're going to make methods operate on those data fields, and those, those, the data resides in a mesh, and then you have fields, and so everything is abstracted in an object-oriented way. So Enzo P will be this astrophysics application, which consists of a collection of physics methods, which if you looked at them, look like sequential programs. Uh, they will re use the services provided by Cello, which I would describe as an extreme stream scale AMR software library that will support multi-physics applications, meaning fluids, particles, rays, whatever else you need. And what's rather unique about this is the parallelism is also outsourced to a parallel programming model and runtime system uh, called Charm++ that handles all the parallelism. It does, it, does the, uh, it does the mapping to processors. It does dynamic load balancing. It does asynchronous execution between the, the elements. And it also supports fault tolerance. Charm++ is not a new thing. In fact, it is the same age as MPI been under continuous development at the University of Illinois for 20 years by Sanjay Kale in his lab. It is the, the thing that's underneath the NAMD, uh, Parallel Molecular Dynamics application that Klaus Schulten has developed uh, that scales to over 200,000 cores on Blue Waters. And so it, it's, not, it's not a new thing, but it is relatively unknown compared to uh, MPI. Since Cello is an object-oriented system, it makes sense to connect it to an object-oriented parallel programming system. So what uh, Charm is in a nutshell is, think of it as a collection of objects. I think of them as ping-pong balls, hundreds of thousands of ping-pong balls. And each ping-pong ball is what's called a char, which is just an object. And you know an object is something that contains data and methods that operate on that data. And it's fully encapsulated. And there's inheritance uh, within the class hierarchy that it exists within. So um, charm consists of a system that allows both dynamic creation of chars and dynamic execution, meaning that um, there's, it, there's, there is no synchronicity. This is the other thing. You can't do synchronous operations at the exascale. Or if you do, because you have to, because of the science, you better do it very infrequently. And you better do as much as you can asynchronously. And uh, that's something that is built into the charm model. So a, a char, so here's a char that creates more chars. And uh, there's a collection of chars. And they, they don't message one another. They do remote procedure calls on other chars um, uh, through what are called entry functions. So it's a completely different world. It's a different paradigm. And in uh, our case, what we have in this tree, this forest of trees, every leaf node is a block of fixed size. If it's a quad tree, it's n by n. Octree, it's n cubed. And each block is a charm plus plus char. So when you, I was saying these ping pong balls, I think of these ping pong balls as containing a little n cubed grid array. This is the fundamental piece of sequential work. And then methods operate on that data. Um, and these are both mesh operations as well as physics operations that come down through the uh, inheritance. Chars are executed dynamically once they have the data they need, and they migrate dynamically based on 
um, a ver whole variety of dynamic load balancing schemes that are built into the CHARM system. And these are looking not only at CPU load, they're looking at network load. And, and now they've evolved it so it, it's energy aware. So the point is, all this parallel crap is completely delegated to the charm team. And of course, if they die, then I'm dead. But actually, I'm not dead. If we go back to this, um, you'll notice down at this layer, um, we have a, a class called parallel. And this will abstract any parallel underpinnings. And we just decided to start with Charm++ as our, as our system. Now, Charm can actually run native on the hardware, or it can run on top of MPI on the hardware. Um, and in fact, we run it in both modes. But should Charm go away, then we would simply uh, modify this layer. And within the, from the standpoint of the design of Enzo Picello, it won't matter. It'll just be something else that are providing those services. This is getting a little more technical. This is the class diagram, and I don't expect you to look at anything uh, in detail. The main point I want to make is uh, what we have running right now, Enzo P consists of an implementation of the PPM method that we just ripped out of Enzo. We also have an MHD method called PPML. So th these methods uh, are running. Um, we have a problem instance that sets up a set off blast wave. And then um, the Enzo block points to these cello blocks. But the point is, Enzo P, the application part, is small and isolated. And an application developer only needs to work here. All of this stuff is basically exposed through an API, a Cello API, that does everything else. Now, I, sh I would have to say, let me just dive in a little bit right here. So field block is all the field data that you need for the problem that you care about. In the case of hydrodynamics, it's density, energy, three components of velocity, maybe a few other things. And uh, this thing, you know, is a class. And so we've already implemented a small class hierarchy whereby you can interleave those arrays. You can do them, you know, one at a time. And this is to support uh, vectorization. So this is the way to solve the problem generally, but it involves recoding. Now, in the case of the flash code, they could simply port the flash um, physics modules on top of Cello, and we would love that, you know. We're going to release Cello uh, by the end of the year. Um, by the way, this, Enzo, this PPML method we got from a Russian, uh, and it's implemented in Fortran 90, and we've interfaced it to Cello. So, and I understand that Flash is a bunch of Fortran 90 modules. So Flash could be ported onto this. Um, but, you know, that's them to decide. Now, the other the interesting thing is, and I've actually looked at the source code. When you look in this source code, you don't see anything that tells you about meshes or uh, uh, I.O., you know. This, this is basically providing a whole set of services. It, this, is, this is something that, you know, a, a physics application developer a sandbox they can work in that just, you know, isolates them from all the complexities of the mesh. Likewise, if you look into the cello source code, you don't see anything that tells you about parallelism. Nothing. That all happens through uh, this kind of, uh, I don't even know what this arrow is called by a computer scientist, but uh, this is like a proxy for that. And, and so the Charm++, which does all the parallelism, uh, is hidden from the cello developer. Okay, so the key points here is that this object-oriented design confers what they call a separation of concerns. The solvers are separate from the data structures, separate from the parallelism, 
And this really, this really permits a separation of development tasks uh, amongst those best equipped to do that kind of development. And also permits software reuse. So for example, these, these solvers, we just pulled them right out of Enzo. We wrap them and interface them to Cello, and, and off they go. The hardest part was this and this interfacing to Charm, um, because Charm is such a different programming paradigm that it's not intuitive to any of us. Um, if you think about MPI, uh, the way a computer scientist describes that is um, uh, communicating sequential programs in, in a bulk synchronous paradigm. It doesn't have to be. MPI can support more than that, but that's the way a lot of apps are written. To go from that view of a of a, of a barrier-driven compute, communicate, compute, communicate to dynamic task execution, it, it, it plays with your head. And so James Bordner actually spent a lot of time, you know, getting it right. All right, so uh, what, what's going to happen now is uh, we've just submitted a proposal to the NSF to build Enzo, migrate Enzo onto this sub substructure. And here's an optimistic development timetable. It's pipelined in the sense that um, because of the separation of concerns, there will be, uh, James Bordner will be doing cello development, adding additional services so that they support the physics solvers that are coming on. And we're going to sequence that as follows. So right now, so the idea is that the Enzo developer community can work on Enzo P, first thing they would do is they would port Enzo's chemistry, uh, and because that's just, you know, involves no communication, that can go straight away right now. Meanwhile, a cello developer will um, work on adding support for linear solvers and adaptive time stepping. That's because the next thing that we'll do at the Enzo level is adding gravity, uh, meanwhile, the cello developer will start um, adding support for particles so that we can do cosmology. Um, and then the develop Enzo developers add in body methods, PM, P cubed M, tree. Uh, and so you see that this pipeline execution will go until after three or four years, we'll get all the physics on. So that's the plan. And finally, uh, let me say that uh, Cello is uh, uh, going to be publicly available um, at this website. You can go there right now and download Cello Enzo P 0.5, which is nothing more than uniform grid stuff. But by the end of the year, we'll have 1.0 released, which will be all the AMR stuff we have working right now with documentation and everything. So um, my hope is that um, not only will this transform or give Enzo a second life or a, as we go to petascale, exascale, that it will be useful for other applications. And if we did it right, it should be fairly simple for application X, many of which the one we've heard about here, could move on to this infrastructure because of the way it's designed. Okay, so that's the end of that talk, and I'd be happy to take questions.